Welcome back. Today is August the 20th, 2023. Joshua Pryor gives a sermon entitled, The Spirit of Holiness. Man, that was really good by Brenda. Thank you, Miss Brenda, for sharing that great and awesome word for us. It's amazing when God lines things up. It's just that happy little stamp within your soul that says, hey, you're on the right path. You know, I'm tired of second guessing myself, and I figure now's the time to stop second guessing myself. So. I may continue, I may make a couple mistakes, but I think I'm tired of second guessing myself. I hope you guys are too. So, Christ in us, the hope of glory, what an amazing reality. I'm going to be speaking on the spirit of holiness, the spirit of holiness in Romans Chapter 1, the Lord for a couple weeks has been telling me, I want you to go back in the book of Romans. And I'm still in the salutation in the beginning. So uh, that's where I am, and that's where I'm going to speak out of a little bit tonight. Romans chapter 1, of course, we have the famous Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek, and to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So in this idea of salvation, we think of salvation maybe as a one time, you know, on this day years ago I was saved, I believed, and I was saved, and that is true. But salvation is a continual uh, expression as your mind is renewed, as your heart continues to take in that essence of Christ in you, the hope of glory. As you you notice more and more that you get closer to God, more and more things kind of spring up with inside of your own self that God is saying to let go, maybe something to forgive, maybe something to forget, maybe something to grab hold of. And I think this all encompasses this idea of salvation, to believe unto the salvation of your soul, that your belief in Christ isn't just this one-time thing. Of course, all of you know, but I'm just taking this as remembrance that your belief in Christ stems from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. And it's really not just the belief of Jesus Christ saving you for some I from some day in the future, you know, to go to heaven. But the salvation of God is for the here and now, for the present moment, that his presence is for the present moment, that his presence is for your salvation in your work, in the way you think, in your emotional places, in wherever you are. He is the God of salvation there. And the good news The expression of that good news is for the salvation, for you to have this overcoming perspective as Don is going to preach about probably a little bit this Sunday. It's this Sunday, right? This Sunday on the seven churches, Don? Saturday. Saturday. Sorry, Saturday. Yes, this Saturday. So I'm going to bump up to verse 1 because, again, I said I was in the the salutation in this beginning part. Um. And he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the good news of God. What is the good news of God? Well, the good news of God is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the earth, that whoever shall believe in him, you know, shall have eternal life. And this eternal life is to know the one true God in Jesus Christ. Christ in his son in whom he is sent so this experiential reality this is good news this is why Christians have such a great perspective on life or we should on our daily lives is that we should be able to recognize the good news if your work people are trying to send you under hey I have great news 
if your family is trying to send you under, I have great news. If whatever's trying to send you under to take you off the goal of, of stepping into that place with God of maturity, Jesus Christ, God sending his son into your life to be the incarnation Christ in you is good news. So this is, he's, in this Paul, he says, I'm set apart for this good news. So it's pretty great. This is his life's call to be set apart for this. Verse 2, and this good news has been promised. This good news of God has been promised through his prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Daniel, all of these prophets, and in the Holy Scriptures. This good news is constantly written about, spoken about, preached about, and is for all our uh, help to understand what the width and the height and the depth of all of this good news is you know when i read in just a minute ago romans chapter one where it talks this for i am unashamed of the gospel the good news for it is the power here in verse one he says the gospel of god you know the good news of god then in verse 9, the good news of his son, the good news of the kingdom. There's so many good news and they all may be wrapped up into one, but there's a differentiation to know and to give understanding, to give meaning to how the good news should be applied. So the general good news in Romans is general. It's over. It doesn't say the good news of God, the good news of Christ, or even Paul later on in the book of Romans is going to say my gospel. He's going to claim it unto himself and he says, my good news, because the good news of God isn't just for God, isn't just of God. It's the good news of his son and the good news of his son isn't just about the good news of his son in relation to him. But it's the good news of us and our personal gospel that we have. Our personal good news isn't just for us, but it's for others around us. Matter of fact, it even extends beyond persons. It extends to all of creation. So this is what the good news is about, and it is good. It is good. It is not bad. It is not horrible. It is not sad. It is, it is good news. And a lot of us think, well, I have to give up my old ways. I have to give up whatever these things are. But, but you're not understanding the good news when we think like that. And I think that's what God is trying to change in me ever, ever more to go beyond what I think. So, so this good news of God, which he promised in his prophets, in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son. So the good news is his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, humanity. Verse 4, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake. So this good news being promised in the flesh through the lineage of through the descendants of David, through the lineage of David. But more so what I want to talk about is that it says he was declared the son of God. And I think this is important that we realize is that he was declared the son of God through the resurrection, that the resurrection was the declaration to humanity, to uh, creation all around him, that this is really the son of God. Now, in eternity past, he was always the son of God. But in the world, he was the son of man. And the greatness of Jesus is that this son of man became the son of God. It wasn't that he wasn't already the son of God, but remember, he poured out his divinity to become like a servant to, to serve us, to bring us this good news. And this is what he did. So he brought this good news. And at the end of it, when he was raised from the dead, that was a declaration back that says, hey, the glory that I once gave up. Remember uh, Jesus' prayer at the end of his life. He says, restore to me the glory I once had, Father. So this is the restoration of the glory that he once had as the son of God. And he was declared the son of God 
by the resurrection of the dead because the resurrection of the dead is the is the is the is the 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 symbol the signage not the symbol but the signage of divinity in humanity that was the sign that says hey this guy is my son the son of god and he used that resurrection of the dead to say it is so he didn't use his humanities the resurrection of the humanity of the body now i'm going to speak a little bit no the my whole sermon's about it it's not a little bit but according to the spirit of holiness according to the spirit of holiness, because this was done according to the spirit of holiness so god wanted me to spend some time extracting what the spirit of holiness is and how we're going to see the good news applied and how we're going to come into that declaration of that you are a son of God. Because remember, the pattern is the true is the same with you and Jesus that it was with Jesus as it is with you. Jesus, born from above, came into the world, had to grow under tutors and different things to grow up into this knowledge of who he was in in time, not outside of time, but in time of who he was to to have the holy spirit come upon him to do all of these miracles to walk out of his ministry to take on all of humanity to die for the sins of the world so that he might be raised as the son of god and as the son of man and you are going through the same process as one who was born from above this is what jesus has done for us is that he took on humanity that's why he's known as the second adam the last adam you were all in Adam. You were all in Christ. Human this is the way he was able to take on the sin of the world, both past, present, and future, is that he took on uh, all of us and who we are. And this is some pretty great news. Some pretty good news. Hallelujah. And he uses this interesting word here, according to the spirit of holiness. So when we say something's according to, it's a, it's, we can see this according to as a, as a way of displaying a pattern. Like, hey, uh, I'm going to get to work according to the road system that is set up in Nashville. I can go take the interstate, interstate, get off out of exit 65, make a left on 65, exit 65, go down here and make a right, I'll be at work. This is according to his pattern. So God's going to give this structure and he's going to call it holiness. And this holiness is a structure, as Daniel said, a space. But I was listening to Ian uh, last week and he says something very interesting about holiness. And I'd like to use this word. This is Ian Clayton. He says, holiness is makes you aware of what you are becoming so when you take this in this understanding of holiness makes you aware of what you are becoming jesus christ as human as a descendant of david was made aware remember because it was according his resurrection was according to holiness so his resurrection death in the body death in the body death of man had to fit according to some pattern the spirit of holiness the structure of holiness and holiness states that whatever comes into the space becomes holy becomes alive becomes new so you can have a spoon a wooden spoon that is just a wooden spoon but what it steps into a space of holiness it becomes holy it becomes like the divinity that it is or whatever aspect that god wants to give it it will become so this is what jesus does with you he takes you and he steps as holy son of god into humanity and he takes humanity in himself and he says now i'm going to deal with this human problem by becoming human in the likeness of sinful flesh What the law could not do, he did in the likeness of sinful flesh. But what is the end result? So that we could be conformed to the image, the likeness of Father. 
So this is how holiness works. This is why I haven't got through this salutation because God gives a structure for Jesus to become who he is in time. If Jesus wanted to remain and if God wanted to just keep him in heaven as the son of God, he could have, but he didn't. He made a choice to send him into the world to send us to take on and to be tempted and tried and all of these things so he could rescue us and ransom us back into the Godhead. And that's what's really there right now. You have a physical body right now in the Godhead. So this is the call that Jesus has put forth into the world. This is the call that Jesus, that God the Father has put forth in the world that in Christ all of humanity can be saved believe that in, believe believe in your heart confess with your mouth obey this reality and it will be in your life that's why last week daniel gave us a little message on what you're speaking what's that one thing that you're paying attention to because in that one word that god gives to you is a salvation to grow and to multiply so Holiness, this spirit of holiness is a structure in which in the present you may realize, hey, I may do this, I may do this, I may do that. You're not acting according to who your true nature is, according to who you really are. So what God does is he puts you in the space. In that space, you will become who you really are. So I want to give an example. Numbers. 17 numbers 17 the book of numbers chapter 17 and this will coincide with the message i did a couple weeks ago when i talked about being the ark of god and there was something within the ark of god oh, there's three things in the ark of god do you remember what they were the hidden manna Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets the ten commandments so today we're going to jump into Aaron's staff that budded, and we're going to see this coincide in Numbers chapter 17. And we're going to see how holiness works and how this resurrection life, this declaration of resurrection life that is hidden within will manifest as power in your life to bring salvation. Okay? Chapter 17, book of Numbers. The people were mocking or murmuring against God, and a bunch of people died. 14,700 died. So they have a problem. So the Lord and Moses are going to do something amazing. Chapter 17, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and get from them a rod for each father's household. 12 rods from all of their leaders according to their father's households and you shall re write each name on his rod in verse 3 and write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi so remember the 12 sons Levi was one of them Judah Reuben my uh Simeon Asher Issachar there's more of them but there was one specific name levi and aaron was a descendant of levi the brother of moses for those who do not know so he took these 12 rods one from each tribe and he wrote on one of them specifically aaron's name so verse four then he lord said you shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where i meet with you so you get this prophetic picture that in the tent of meeting where Moses would go in and meet with God and God would speak to him face to face. The call was to take these 12 rods, wood, made of wood, humanity, these 12 dimensions of humanity cut off from the life of God, dead. When you cut something from a tree, what is a, a limb? It's dead branch, right? So he's going to go set them before the God of the living. This is a real space, the testimony, a real reality. He's going to go set them there, right? So what do we have? This space. Remember I talked about holiness, this space that is created. So there's a space created. Now resurrection is the declaration of divinity, of the Son, 
of the Father. And what is the Son? The Son is the manifestation of the Father in time. So when he's talking about the Son of God, he says the manifestation of God in time. So the manifestation of divinity in time has to be seen through the Son because the Father won't do it himself. He needs a Son to do it. Jesus Christ, of course. The Son, the only begotten of the Son, full of grace and truth. So he says, deposit in this testimony, in this tent, where God is going to meet with them. Verse 5. Notice, he wrote on his name. Verse 5. It will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. The rod of the man. Not the rod of some existential being, not the rod of some angel, not the, but the rod of the man. Because God is wanting to manifest who he is in man. Don't throw away humanity because God is wanting to manifest in that humanity. Remember how, it, you know, uh, Christopher always said, we're not a bunch of Gnostics. All right, verse 5. It will come about that the rod of the man who I choose will sprout. Thus I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who you are, who are grumbling against you. So what he's saying is that this rod when it sprout is going to act as a division between what I'm, what God is capable of hearing. I'm going to, it's going to lessen the grumblings of that what I'm here because the manifestation of a man with resurrection life can act as a mediator between all of those complaining and who I am as holy God. So you should know something about what God is going to do through the man Christ Jesus. Remember, this good news, this is good news that has been spoken in the Holy Scriptures. Well, here it is, some good news in the Holy Scriptures. That there was going to be one who was going to step in and mediate between God and your grumblings, God and your complainings, God and everything else that you have a trouble with in your life. There is a mediator, the one Jesus Christ. Man, I just love Jesus. Hallelujah. Y'all don't really know how God good how good God is cuz he anticipates all of our grumblings and complainings. He says, "I've already made a space to set someone in there." And this is a man. This isn't just an angel who's going to be in the space. This is a man. So stop trying to separate yourself, your humanity from who you're called to be, future purpose there. Verse 6, Moses therefore spoke to the sons of Israel, and all their leaders give him, give him a rod apiece. For each leader, according to their father's household, 12 rods, with a rod of Aaron among their rods. So Moses deposited rods before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. He gave the rods and he put them in the tent of the testimony before, the God, before God Almighty. Do you know in the book of Hebrews, there's some good news that says, come to the throne of grace. From Moses' perspective, he was coming to the throne. He was coming to the living God who was there in reality. But we want to separate ourselves from coming to this living God. I don't know why. Maybe because we're scared. Maybe because we don't actually know what the good news is all about. But God is tired of this separation, so he's going to do something about it. So deposits the rods before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. Now on the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted, and had put forth buds, produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. So this man, who this is allegorically speaking of, this rod, this staff, this man, this human is cut off from the life of God, but he's going to spend so much time in that house, in that tent of meeting before the face of God, that whatever is dead is actually going to come to life. And it's going to spring forth a sprout. 
It's going to spring forth buds. It's going to flower even. And then it's not done yet. It's going to produce full almonds that are capable of eating, that are capable of providing sustenance and protein. Right? That's what almonds, that's what all the healthy people tell you to eat almonds. Right? There may be a reason there. Some of them do, at least. If it's good enough for Aaron's staff, it's probably good enough for you to eat a couple almonds. Okay. So Moses then brought out all the rods from the presence of the Lord to the, all the sons of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. But the Lord said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign. So the resurrection is a sign against the rebels that you may put an end to their grumblings against me so that you will not die. Do you know why Jesus Christ came? To bring life and life abundantly so that you will not see death. Matter of fact, that's a big hope in Revelation is that you will not see this, excuse me, the second death. So what is this budded rod? Remember, it is the in-between place. If you're lacking of obedience, because remember, the good news is what? To bring about obedience for the unbelieving, for the Gentile. So if you, where are you not believing? What do you need? What do you need to see? You need to see resurrection life. Well, where's the place you're going to see resurrection life? In the tent, face to face with God. Resurrection life is only seen face to face with God. It's only seen in this tent of meeting. The only way for humanity to take on life, this divine life, is to spend time in this tent. To spend time in this meeting place. If you want to stop death in your life, if you want to stop the plague in your life, as this will do, Spend time in the tent of meeting and believe that you can spend time with there, meeting with God, coming boldly before the throne of God. Set yourself there and expect resurrection life to be manifested to you. This is the spirit of holiness. When you are walking in the structure of holiness, it says those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that digitally seek them. What is his reward? His reward is resurrection life. His reward is divine presence. His reward is his face. So when you step before in between that veil through the blood of Jesus, what's his blood do? Creates a new and living way. To set off as those things, all those complaining and those grumblings. And therefore, when I step in before God, I'm clean and I can expect resurrection to start manifesting in my life. And you say, well, where's resurrection? I'm not walking by someone and they're getting up yet. Well, what was the pattern shown off? He stood for a whole day within that tent. And what happened? The omen, the dead had to what? Sprout first. Then it had to blossom or had to bud. Then it blossomed and flowered. So some of y'all must be in y'all's beauty stage. Y'all are just pretty little flowers. Y'all haven't given up y'all's almonds yet. You're not actually able to give forth the almond tree. But I guarantee you don't give up. Just don't remain on that beauty stage. Stay in there a little while. Stay in there in your prayer tent in that secret place with God. That's why Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount clearly says, go into the secret place. Shut the door. Spend time because he knows that's the place where resurrection happens in that unseen place. Don't give up on the beauty stage, but keep going until you can give forth an almond tree. And people will say, well, you're only a man. But I don't think you understand who my father is and understand who my brother is when you say I'm only a man. Just let me draw back into this stage, into this secret place. Is that not what Jesus did for 30 years? Y'all want to sit here and say, hey, if I'm, I should be able to do it all. But you're not going to follow your older brother, are you, and spend 30 years spending time with your father in that secret place? 
Maybe there's a structure of holiness, a structure of stepping into that place and looking at that face and saying how I'm, how I'm just sprouting, how I'm just budding, how I'm just becoming a flower. But soon and very soon, I guarantee you, I'm going to give forth some almonds and you're going to see those almonds and they're going to be strength for the body of Christ around me and I'm going to be able to stop the plague from moving. I'm going to be able to curtail the people's grumblings around me. Because as a priest, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be a mediator between God and man. And that's what Moses did, right? How many times he said, oh, oh God, don't destroy them. They're your children. After God said, surely I would destroy them. I mean, think about that boldness to stand as a man. He wasn't, you know, he's just spent time with God. He knows God. Therefore, he can speak as, ah. Uh, Someone is a friend of God and he can call God on what God needs to call, be called to. Because in time, God is sovereign and he loves us, but he submits himself to us. He submits himself to his ways. There you go. He submits himself to his ways that he has showed us. We're meaning God is a little bit reflective as well. So if you come to God and you think that he's an old, dirty man who wants to destroy you for all your sin, guess what? That's probably going to come upon you. That's why he says you must believe that God is and he was a rewarder. If you're coming to God like he's going to destroy you, well, you're never going to really come to the true God. And God may severally, sovereignly come down and say, I'm not really that God. And he may bring friends in your life. Like Brenda had friends in her dorm room hallway who said, hey, this is the one true God. This is the one true God. God will send people in your life to tell you this is the one true God. But you got to step outside of your own mind and you got to say, hey, something ain't right here. I'm going to take a step that I maybe don't know who God is. And I'm going to let go of what I think. And I'm going to let God speak to me face to face. Because I'm tired of my life sucking. God has the best for you. He's good and he's full of love and full of mercy. But if you look in numbers here and throughout the 40 years in the desert. Man, he's doing a lot of destroying. Why? Why? Why is he doing a lot of destroying? He's getting treated that way by the people. Just maybe. Maybe if the people would have changed their mind like Moses. Maybe they would have seen that promise in the beginning. Before they even had to go into the wilderness. Hey, my father's so good. That he can call me out of Egypt. And lead me right into the promised land. Maybe my father's just that good. But we say, no, I can't be because I'm looking. I'm looking where? To my past. I'm looking to my humanity without that new creation. So when you come to God and you're that staff, and you may say, I'm just a dead staff. But realize when you step in that tent, resurrection power will begin to speak to you. And you know what already is. If you're here, you're already a child of God. It's already spoken a little bit. Y'all are just sprouting, and God will continue sprouting in your life. Sprout, sprout, sprout. But he wants you to step into that fullness of giving forth that almond. But you got to spend time inside with the ark of the testimony, inside with that tent of meeting, inside that sphere of holiness, that structure, that when I step in, I become. I'm aware of what I'm not. So what happened to the rod that budded? It, it was aware of being a tree and it acted like a tree even though it was just a branch. So you want your body to act like it's not getting old and decrepit. You want your body to be renewed and see that it's, a, it's fresh, it's youth. It's the youth as the dawn. Well, maybe you got to spend time in that secret place, in that place of resurrection to quit to get acting, to become acting like you aren't really. I don't know if I said that right, but y'all can understand what I'm saying. To stop acting like a branch and start acting like a tree. 
And that's a miracle right there. <sighs> Jesus, I leave you with this. I leave you with this. Remember after Jesus is, you know, he's, Peter's denied God. And in John chapter 20, he says a great statement that I absolutely love. He says a great statement that I absolutely love. He says a great statement that, he, that he, I absolutely love about Jesus. Peter's denied him. He gets up out of the grave. And I don't know if you've denied the Lord in your life. You may have said some things. So Peter before has denied him three times, right? Okay. Well, before seeing Peter... In verse 17 of chapter 20, Jesus is going to say something. Jesus is going to say something. And what is he going to say in verse 17? Jesus said to her, the woman, Mary. Jesus says to her, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, say to them what? I ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. So what is this saying? This is resurrection life speaking. This is resurrected Jesus speaking. This is him declared as the son of God, resurrected life. If you don't know where you are, if you don't know how to get to where you're going, always start from this, this part right here. This is right when he comes out, and it's the first word everybody needs to hear from the words of Jesus. Go tell them. Go speak to my brothers. Remember, Peter's just denied the Lord three times. But yet, what is Jesus saying to Peter? Before he's re repented of that unbelief or whatever, he says, go and tell my brothers. That my father and my God is their father and their God and your father and your God. Jesus is surrounding himself or he's surrounding this resurrection life is surrounding these disciples who are cut off by the life of God before. And he says, hey, these are my brothers, my father's their same father. This reality that Jesus gives to Mary and to the disciples, your father and your God are my father and my God. Don't take that for lightly. Don't take that vainly. Don't believe that vainly. Don't believe in vain. Let that sprout. Give forth a bud. Give forth a blossom. Give forth an almond. So tonight for ministry, The structure of holiness is to step in to a place that is full of the resurrection of God. That tent of meeting. Now in your own personal lives, you need to be going to that place of resurrection where it's God and man sitting face to face. That place is in you. That place is there. Jesus says very clearly that John the Baptist was the greatest among the prophets. But you yourself are greater. Whoever is least in the kingdom is greater than he. If John the Baptist was greater than Moses and Moses got to speak face to face, let's use some great logic and step into that place. Now, for ministry, what happened to the rod? It budded. What happened before it budded? Aaron's name was written on it. And it was put before the Lord. And I want you to take your name, the essence of who you are. And for ministry tonight, this is, we're going we're gonna to imagine. This is the threshold right here, past these seats. If you want to, you don't have to. These threshold right here, this is the threshold between uh, the inner place and the outer place in the tabernacle where you can meet God face to face. I want you to say your name. I am Joshua Lee Pryor. I am 
And I want you to go slow. And this is ministry. Bless you guys on the thing. I hope you get uh, on the on the internet live stream. I'm so in the zone. Excuse me. But I don't want everyone to do this online. So I bless you guys. But you can do this. Go in the temple. Make a threshold. There you go. Blessings. Peace be upon you. So for ministry tonight, as he touched that off, you're going to take your name. I am Joshua Lee Pryor. I am whatever your name is. And you mean that name. You see that name. You believe that name. That name carries essence of who you are. That's what Moses is doing. He's, he's, taking, his, he's taking these names and he says, which name are you going to resurrect? Which name are you going to resurrect? You already know you're resurrected in Jesus. Resurrected humanity. There you go. So you know your name's already there. But I want you to put meaning into it. I want you to think of your name as there and I want you to step across this threshold for yourself and put it for the Lord face to face if you want to well I just I'm going to sing a little bit in the spirit so if you want you can come on now but take slow steps put meaning if you need to walk with the blood but I mean walk slow carry it within your heart see it you can even take your staff yeah, that's even better. Take your staff. Feel your staff. Grasp your staff. Your walking stick. Your humanity. Your power. Your strength. Your might. And there's, there's a lot more depth here, but we'll just give it that. And carry that before the Lord. And start becoming that tree in which you are. 